Good morning, everyone. Welcome back to another week. We'll be continuing our study in, in uh, Genesis, getting into the thrilling genealogies in chapter 10. Uh, actually, there's quite a bit to be learned there, so I've got some pictures to help us learn that. I'll talk about that in just a moment. But if you want to open your Bibles to Genesis chapter 9, uh, we'll go over what we've been over in at, at the end of that chapter and then move on into chapter 10. And as you're finding that, I'll open us in a word of prayer. Our Father God in heaven, thank you for another day of your grace. God, we are so grateful every day to draw breath this side of heaven, knowing that you are offering grace and peace to a world that will simply trust you. I'm thankful, Father, for the grace you've shown us in Christ Jesus, that anyone can be in Christ when they trust that you've paid for their sin through his shed blood. Lord, I'm thankful for the simple gospel, and I'm thankful for the joy it is to get to know you as we read through all of your word. Uh, I'm so thankful that you've given us this book that we hold and that we treasure, uh, that we can get to know you more and more and live as your ambassadors until you do call us home. Lord, it's, it's a joy knowing of that blessed hope, and I pray this morning, as always, you fill us with as much wisdom and spiritual understanding that we may have, uh, that we can grow in grace and the knowledge of the truth. In Christ's name, amen. amen. All right, so Genesis chapter 9, verse 18 to the end says, And the sons of Noah that went forth of the ark were Shem and Ham and Japheth, and the Ham is the father of Canaan. These are the three sons of Noah, and of them was the whole earth overspread. And Noah began to be an husbandman, and he planted a vineyard, and he drank of the wine and was drunken, and he was uncovered within his tent. And Ham, the father of Canaan, saw the nakedness of his father, and told his two brethren without. And Shem and Japheth took a garment and laid it upon both their shoulders, and went backward and covered the nakedness of their father. And their faces were backward, and they saw not their father's nakedness. And Noah awoke from his wine and knew what his younger son had done unto him. And he said, Cursed be Canaan, a servant of servants shall he be unto his brethren. And he said, Blessed be the Lord God of Shem, and Canaan shall be his servant. God shall enlarge Japheth, and he shall dwell in the tents of Shem, and Canaan shall be his servant. And Noah lived after the flood 350 years, and all the days of Noah were 950 years, and he died. Okay. Try to briefly recap the things we've talked about so far. Uh, considering the cursing of Canaan, God is not cursing the child for the father's sin. As we know, God will not do that. We looked at several verses that say exactly the, those words. We know that God is a just judge. We look at many verses that talked about that, that he will render to every man according to their own works. Okay? And so we can trust that he's going to do the right thing. Uh, we also read three specific verses that says fathers are not put to death for the children and their sins and vice versa, kind of reiterating the first thing that I've already said. Uh, so hopefully after all of that, it's very clear that God is a just judge and the judgment is upon the heart of every man. So that's why I've challenged and continue to challenge where is my heart at every day to make sure I'm still in line <laughs> or as the today's verbiage goes, right with God. Right? And in order to be right with God, you simply trust him, but in order to possess this vessel in sanctification, like it says in 1 Thessalonians 4, then we need to be in obedience to his spirit, not quench it. Right? So that's how we can walk with God, I think is how the, the phrase goes. Uh, out of the heart proceeds good or bad fruit. Uh, we looked at Matthew 7, 15, uh, 7 and 15 where our Lord Jesus says those words or gives us that idea, right? It's not the washing of your hands that's as, a, as an important or what food goes into your body that's important as what comes out of the mouth, right? And he had to explain very, you know, kind of silly to us, you know when you eat food where it ends up, right? <laughs> it's, but it's out of the heart proceeds things that may defile the man, right? So we need to to be pure in the heart rather than just in the words. Because many people will say unto him, Lord, Lord, didn't we do all these things in your name? And yet Jesus is going to say, I never knew you. Because right? their heart wasn't there. They're doing the right works, and I air quote that, 
uh, because it's more of a facade than anything. But the heart is in the wrong place, and so the judgment is upon the heart, and that's the main point I wanted to take away from all of that. And so then applying God's character, knowing God's character to Genesis 9.25, when Noah says, Curse be Cain, and a servant, a servant shall be unto his brethren, and essentially shall end up serving Shem and Japheth. This is a, uh, a prophecy just saying what is going to happen. It's not Canaan being cursed for what Ham did, or Canaan being put to the worst because Ham was a jerk or sinned. Right? It's just a prophecy saying this is what's going to happen because God knows the hearts of all, the, all men. And so he knows the future, and this is just what's going to end up happening. Now, as we go through Genesis 10 and start looking at the sons of Ham, who they are, where they are, and uh, what they end up doing, we'll get to see a little bit more of that picture of basically just history unfolding. Let's see. So we have the benefit of history recorded for us. At that time, they had no idea. Yeah, that's another thing that we've got to try to reconcile in our minds. But uh, they didn't know it at that point. We know that Canaan is going, the, the descendants of Canaan are going to start off oppressing the descendants of Shem, I suppose, and Japheth. But the tables will be turned where Israel, descendants of Shem, will eventually possess the land of Canaan, push them out, and Canaan shall serve them. Right? Just like God is saying right here. Uh, we also talked last week, I think it was last week, about uh, verse 25 being taken out of context that uh, it was used from pulpits to promote racism, saying that people of darker skin should be slaves because of this verse right here. However, well, that's not the case. We know that God made of all nations, made all nations of one blood. Right? It all came from Adam. And uh, even other verses we've looked at, like 1 Corinthians 11, where it says, Neither is the man without the woman, nor the woman without the man in the Lord. We're all on equal footing spiritually. So everybody needs to trust Christ if they want eternal life in paradise, instead of rejecting him, holding that truth in unrighteousness, and uh, getting the just reward from that, which is eternal separation from God and what God has called the lake of fire. <clears throat> So that would be bad. <laughs> but to trust in God gets, gets us eternal life in paradise, to trust that Jesus Christ paid for our sin on the cross of Calvary. It has nothing to do with the color of skin, color of eyes, color of hair, lack of hair, too much hair. Like It doesn't matter any of those physical properties. It's a spiritual thing. Okay. But we did, I did point out a couple of quotes, even from our own government's archives where they came up with this American Colonization Society, or ACS, to establish Liberia as a recolonization for the dark-skinned people. Again, that's just a bunch of nonsense. But uh, the evolutionary mindset also backs that up, saying that the lighter-skinned people are better, and somehow, I don't know, I didn't really look at that too much. But uh, if you did read Darwin's famous book, the origin of species, and there's a whole bunch of other words that go along with it, but it's basically the idea of racism. So it promotes racism. Uh, it causes divide amongst people, whereas we're all human. Uh, people have tried to share things like we all bleed red. It doesn't matter what the color of anything of our bodies is, <laughs> right? We all are human, and that's the whole point, is that we all are in need of a savior. So these verses definitely do not promote racism. It's just prophecy of what's going to play out in history. I think that kind of recaps what we did last week. Any lingering thoughts, questions? Not a... Oh, yeah. There was the comical thing I had to bring up last week with the daughters of Heth. Right, with uh, Esau marrying the daughters of Heth. But we'll talk a little bit more about that, too, uh, this morning. <clears throat> All right, so let's begin Genesis chapter 10. It says, Now these are the generations of the sons of Noah, Shem, Ham, and Japheth, and unto them were sons born after the flood, the sons of Japheth, Gomer, and Magog, and Madai, and Javan, and Tubal, and Meshach, and Tyrus, the sons of Gomer, Ashkenaz and Ripeth and Togarma, 
and the sons of Javan, Elisha, and Tarshish, Kittim, and Dodanim. By these were the isles of the Gentiles divided in their lands, every one after his tongue. Now that's a little interesting when you read that, isn't it? Because up until this point, everyone had exactly one language. So this is giving us a little bit of a futuristic perspective, uh, not just at that time, but also after the Tower of Babel incident. So I just want to point that out. So everyone after their tongue, after their families, in their nations. Okay, so there's a division going on amongst Japheth's and Ham's and Shem's sons, uh, where all the different cultures and such come from. So uh, let's just look back at a few of these names. Uh, verse 2, Gomer, Magog, Madai, Javan, Tubal, Meshach, Tyrus. A lot of those may be familiar to you. We do read those in the famous Ezekiel 38 prophecy, Gog, Magog. Uh, also, Gog, Magog is mentioned in Revelation 20. That's the end battle after the millennial reign when Satan is loosed for a short season or a little season and collects all the unbelievers still, which does blow my mind, uh, against Jesus and Jerusalem and all the saints, and of course they just fall down dead. So it's not that exciting of a, of a battle. But uh, that's where those names come from, or where those names are mentioned. Javan is the same as Ionia, which is Greece, that area. Uh, Ashkenaz is said to be the Armenians. They are mentioned in Jeremiah 51. I'm not going to go there. I'm just letting you know that that's where it is. Uh, but they happen to be in northeast Turkey of modern day. Uh, I did want to point out some on this picture. Let me bring it up so I can see it. That one. Hopefully you can read these. But if you can't, I'm sorry. Uh, <laughs> we've got some slides maybe that will be available uh, to look at it online. But if you can pinpoint where Greece is, right under the word Greece, that's where Javan, his name is. To the left of that is Elisha, which is in verse 4 here. Europe is described as the Isles of the Gentiles. Tarshish has his name over there. Gomer, Gomer Magog, Ashkenaz, those are all in the north where modern-day Russia is. <clears throat> Hey, uh, Gomer, Ashkenaz, Tubal, Meshach, those are all just south of Gomer and Magog. So beneath the, is that the Black Sea right there? I'm having a little trouble with my geography right now. Uh, so they're, they're right there just south of Gomer, Magog, and all that. So basically, Japheth went north and filled up all that land. Give me a minute to bring back up my notes. There we go. Okay, so that's Japheth. There's not a lot to go off of. He's got five verses to his name and his sons. Any, anyone have anything yet to share? <laughs> I don't really think so. But now that we're going to talk about the sons of Ham, we got some more things to chat about. Okay, so Genesis 10.6 says the sons of Ham, Cush, and Mizraim, and Put, and Canaan. And the sons of Cush, Seba, and Havilah, and Sabta, and Rayama, and Sabteca, and the sons of Rayama, Sheba, and Dedan. And Cush begat Nimrod. He began to be a mighty one in the earth. He was a mighty hunter before the Lord, wherefore it is said, even as Nimrod the mighty hunter before the Lord. And the beginning of his kingdom was Babel, and Erek, and Achad, and Kalna in the land of Shinar. Out of that land went forth Asher, and builded Nineveh, and the city of Rehoboth, and Kela, and Reson between Nineveh and Kela, the same is a great city. And Mizraim begat Ludim, and Ananim, and Lehabim, and Naphtahim, and Pathrasim, and Kaslehim, out of whom came Philistim, the Philistines, and Kaphtarim. And Canaan begat Sidon, his firstborn, and Heth. And the Jebusite, and the Amorite, and the Gergesite, and the Hivite, and the Archite, and the Sinite, and the Arbadite, and the Zemurite, and the Hamathite. Whew, a lot of ites. And afterward were the families of the Canaanites spread abroad. That might be indicative of the Babel event right there. Uh, verse 19, And the border of Canaanites was from Sidon, as thou comest to Gerar, unto Geza, as thou goest unto Sodom and Gomorrah, and Adma and Zeboim, even unto Lasha. These are the sons of Ham after their families. And again, there's that phrase, after their tongues. 
in their countries and in their nations. Whew. All right, that was fun, wasn't it? Now let's go back and understand a little bit more about these names. First off, Ham is used in our Bibles that's synonymous with Egypt or that area. Okay, and I do want to look at some verses with this. So we'll come back here shortly if you turn with me to Psalm 78. <clears throat> Psalm 78, you know me, I like context. So let's go back to verse 31. Well, I don't really have to. Yeah, I kind of do. Okay, uh, Psalm 78, verse 31 says, The wrath of God came upon them, and slew the fattest of them, and smote down the chosen men of Israel. For all this they sinned still, and believed not his wondrous works. Therefore their days did he consume in vanity, and their years in trouble. When he slew them, they sought him, and they returned and inquired early after God. And they remembered that God was their rock, and the high God their redeemer. Nevertheless they did flatter him with their mouth, and they lied unto him with their tongues. For their heart was not right with him, neither were they steadfast in his covenant. But he, being full of compassion, forgave their iniquity, and destroyed them not. Yea, many a time turned he his anger away, and did not stir up all his wrath. For he remembered that they were but flesh, a wind that passeth away, and cometh not again. How oft did they provoke him in the wilderness, and grieve him in the desert? Yea, they turned back, and tempted God, and limited the Holy One of Israel. They remembered not his hand, nor the day when he delivered them from the enemy. How he had wrought his signs in Egypt, and his wonders in the field of Zoan, and had turned their rivers into blood, and their floods that they could not drink. He sent diverse sorts of flies among them, which devoured them, and frogs which destroyed them. He gave also their increase unto the caterpillar, and their labor unto the locust. He destroyed their vines with hail, and their sycamore trees with frost. He gave up their cattle also to the hail and their flocks to hot thunderbolts. He cast upon them the fierceness of his anger with wrath and indignation and trouble by sending evil angels among them. He made a way to his anger. He spared not their soul from death, but gave their life over to pestilence and smote all the firstborn in Egypt, the chief of their strength, in the tabernacles of Ham. Okay. So I just wanted to point out last week that I mentioned Ham is... Uh, the descendants of Ham, which you can kind of see up here, are mostly in northern Africa, that region, northern and northeastern especially. But uh, Egypt here is used as, or sorry, Ham is used as a synonym with Egypt in this passage. If you turn to Psalm 105, we get another example of kind of the same thing. Let's do verse, okay, yeah, we got to go back to verse 6. <clears throat> Psalm 105, verse 6 says, O ye seed of Abraham, his servant, ye children of Jacob, his chosen. He is the Lord our God, his judgments are in all the earth. He hath remembered his covenant forever, the word which he commanded to a thousand generations, which covenant he made with Abraham and his oath with Isaac, and confirmed the same unto Jacob for a law, and to Israel for an everlasting covenant, saying, Unto thee will I give the land of Canaan, the lot of your inheritance, when they were but a few men in number, yea, very few, and strangers in it, when they went from one nation to another, from one kingdom to another people. He suffered no man to do them wrong, yea, he reproved kings for their sakes, saying, Touch not mine anointed, and do my prophets no harm. Moreover, he called for a famine upon the land. He brake the whole staff of bread. He sent a man before them, even Joseph, who was sold for a servant, whose feet they hurt with fetters. He was laid in iron. Until the time that his word came, the word of the Lord tried him. The king sent and loosed him, even the ruler of the people, and let him go free. He made him lord of his house and ruler of all his substance, to bind his princes at his pleasure and teach his senators wisdom. 
Israel also came into Egypt, and Jacob sojourned in the land of Ham. And he increased greatly, or he increased his people greatly, and made them stronger than their enemies. He turned their heart to hate his people, to deal subtly with his servants. Well, how far did I want to go here? Oh, more? Okay. He sent Moses his servant and Aaron whom he had chosen. They showed his signs among them and wonders in the land of Ham. There we go. There's the other verse. So just wanted to show a couple of verses. There's another one in Psalm 106, which I kind of want to read the whole thing. So I won't do that, as I don't think we need to go over that again. But it mentions the land of Ham as synonymous with Egypt. So if we want to turn back to Genesis 10, uh, got to have two. I need another screen. Yeah, I had to look at my notes first. Uh, here in Genesis 10, so the sons of Ham, uh, verse 6 then. So Ham is synonymous with Egypt. It's the northern African type geography, which again is why the words were twisted, saying, well, the dark-skinned people come from there. That's why they can all be slaves, which of course is bogus. Uh, here, his first son is named Cush. Now in the Hebrew, uh, it's, it's pretty much pronounced that way, Cush or Cushi or something like that. Uh, but that is synonymous with Ethiopia. So I don't know if that's up here. Yeah, okay, so Cush is right by Ethiopia. It's on the southern, southeasternmost point of this map here. Uh, so that's that same area. Just for an FYI, uh, Zipporah, the wife of Moses, in Numbers 12.1 is called a Cushite. So she was from that region. Uh, let's see, Mizraim is synonymous also with Egypt, so his descendants were in that space. Put, that's how you say that, is uh, synonymous with Libya. Put is mentioned in several different places. And uh, let's look at a couple of those, because we'll be familiar with some. So again, mark Genesis 10 and go to Ezekiel 27. Ezekiel 27 and verse 9. It's the place where it mentions put. So Ezekiel 27 verse 9 says, The ancients of Gebal and the wise men thereof were in thee thy cockers. All the ships of the sea with their mariners were in thee to occupy thy merchandise. They of Persia and of Lud and of Put were in thine army, thy men of war. They hang the shield and helmet in thee. They set forth thy comeliness. The men of Arvad with thine army were upon the walls round about, and the Gamadims were in thy towers. They hang their shields upon thy walls round about. They have made thy beauty perfect. This is, if you go back to verse 1, it's the lament, or the... Lamentation for Tyre. Okay, so verse 12 says, Tarshish was thy merchant by reason of thy multitude of all kinds of riches. With silver, iron, tin, and lead, they traded in thy fairs. Javan, Tubal, and Meshach, they were thy merchants. They traded the persons of men and vessels of brass in thy market. I just want to go to those verses just to say that you know, these descendants, all the earth was overspread by them. Their names are mentioned over and over. So we can kind of see get a good picture of geography. I'm just trying to point out that this map didn't just appear like this. People have done a lot more studying than I have, looking at all these different uh, places and that the, the names are mentioned. And uh, so here we see not just Put, but also the descendants of Japheth. Javon, Tubal, Meshach were doing business with uh, Tyre. <laughs> okay. Uh, also, since we're in Ezekiel, if you turn to Ezekiel 38, We'll read the first six verses here. Ezekiel 38, verse 1. And the word of the Lord came unto me, saying, Son of man, set thy face against Gog, the land of Magog, the chief prince of Meshach and Tubal, 
and prophesy against him, and say, Thus saith the Lord God, Behold, I am against thee, O Gog, the chief prince of Meshach and Tubal, and I will turn thee back and put hooks into thy jaws, and I will bring thee forth and all thine army, horses and horsemen, all of them clothed with all sorts of armor, even a great company with bucklers and shields, all of them handling swords. Persia, Ethiopia, which is Cush, and Libya, put with them, all of them with shield and helmet. Gomer and all his bands, the house of Togarma, of the north quarters, and all his bands, and many people with thee. So again, we see all these descendant groups. This is part of that famous prophecy that they're all going to come against Jesus, essentially. Okay, so put is sometimes hidden in the word Libya in your Bibles, but that's who that is. Uh, same thing with Ethiopia and Cush. All right, what's our next name? Okay, Cana Canaanan. <laughs> Canaan is synonymous with Phoenicia, if you've heard of that region or term. Uh, you can see about where that is. It is where the land of Israel is, too, uh, today. So we get an idea of his location. Uh, I did have notes before I jumped into Nimrod of the other names, mostly just to get them out of the way. Because uh, I know sometimes it's really cool. Hey, this is fun history. And sometimes it's like, I don't know how to pronounce these names. You know, this is lame. <laughs> so um, hopefully you're, you're more on the first side of that. Uh, so if we jump down to verse 15, the sons of Canaan, he begat Sidon, his firstborn. This is going to be like Sidon of Tyre and Sidon fame, uh, the northern part of Phoenicia, the northern part of what we know as the land of Canaan. Uh, <clears throat> and that's where they are. In case you're wondering, the name of Sidon means fish town, so it's probably very aptly named. Uh, let's see, Heth then. Heth is where the Hittites, that term comes from. We looked at a bit of that, how the daughters of Heth were a grievance of mind to Isaac and Rebekah. Uh, so their, their hearts weren't in a very good place. <laughs> uh, that's why Jacob was not allowed to get a wife from the daughters of Heth. Let's see, they are in the mountain region in the south of Palestine. Uh, the Jebusite here in verse 16, they held territory that the tribe of Benjamin would inherit later, and they also held Jerusalem until David took it. Okay, so that's the history that I know of for the Jebusite. The Amorites, now these guys have a bit of an interesting history. The Amorite uh, is said to be in Moabite territory west of the Dead Sea and in the mountains. Okay, they have five kings that we know of. Those five kings are mentioned in Joshua 10 verse 5 in case you care to look. Uh, I was not going to go there, but I did want to read Genesis 15. If you want to mark again uh, chapter 10 here, we'll be back shortly. But if you look at Genesis chapter 15, this is when God is making a... The, God has a discussion with Abraham again, and this is that recording of uh, Abraham's faith being counted as righteousness. So let's look in verse 1, where it says, After these things the word of the Lord came unto Abram in a vision, saying, Fear not, Abram, I am thy shield and thy exceeding great reward. And Abram said, Lord God, what wilt thou give me, seeing I go childless, and the steward of my house is this Eliezer of Damascus? And Abram said, Behold, to me thou hast given no seed, and lo, one born in my house is mine heir. And behold, the word of the Lord came unto him, saying, This shall not be thine heir, but he that shall come forth out of thine own bowels shall be thine heir. And he brought him forth abroad and said, Look now toward heaven and tell the stars, that means count them, if thou be able to number them. And he said unto him, So shall thy seed be. And he believed in the Lord, and he counted it to him for righteousness. And he said unto him, I am the Lord that brought thee out of Ur of the Chaldees to give thee this land to inherit it. And he said, Lord God, whereby shall I know that I shall inherit it? And he said unto him, Take me an heifer of three years old, and a she-goat of three years old, and a ram of three years old, and a turtle dove, and a young pigeon. And he took unto him all these, and divided them in the midst, and laid each piece one against another, but the birds divided he not. 
And when the fowls came down upon the carcasses, Abram drove them away. And when the sun was going down, a deep sleep fell upon Abram, and lo, an horror of great darkness fell upon him. And he said unto Abram, Know of a surety that thy seed shall be a stranger in a land that is not theirs, and shall serve them, and shall afflict them four hundred years. And also that nation whom they shall serve will I judge, and afterward shall they come out with great substance. And thou shalt go to thy fathers in peace, thou shalt be buried in a good old age. But in the fourth generation they shall come hither again, for the iniquity of the Amorites is not yet full. That's such an interesting statement to me. It's easy to gloss over, but isn't it interesting that God is not bringing judgment yet? Because apparently there's some that have a good heart there that actually trust God, even though we don't know them. That's just my speculation based on what God said. Because he says that the iniquity is not yet full. But when it was full, guess what happened to them? You go and conquer all these and you kill everything in them. Right? To Israel, to the nation of Israel. Right, so I'm going to skip over, I think, going on the next verses, but we can look at the Amorite in Genesis 48, in Exodus 23, in Joshua 12, and actually, let's look at this one in Amos chapter 2, because we don't go to the minor prophets too often. Uh, Amos chapter 2, verses 9 and 10. Just to give us a little more glimpse of the Amorite. Amos chapter 2, verse 9. God says, Yet I destroyed the Amorite before them. I guess I should have backed up a little bit, but we can we can understand who them is. Whose height, the Amorite's height, was like the height of the cedars, and he was strong as the oaks. Yet I destroyed his fruit from above and his roots from beneath. Also I brought you up from the land of Egypt and led you 40 years to the wilderness to possess the land of the Amorite. So obviously he's talking about Israel here. And he did away with the Amorites because their iniquity at some point was full. Okay, so just some interesting tidbits about the Amorite. Back in Genesis 10, the next ite is the Gergesite. And they're only mentioned in Genesis, or Joshua 24:11. Otherwise, they're not really known. Uh, the Hivite, they're mentioned a few places. I think the most interesting is Joshua 9, if you'll turn there with me. Joshua 9, I won't go through the whole thing, but I'll start with verse 1 and skip around a little bit. So Joshua 9, verse 1. So as it came to pass when all the kings which were on this side Jordan in the hills and in the valleys and in all the coasts of the great sea over against Lebanon, the Hittite and the Amorite, the Canaanite, the Perizzite, the Hivite, and the Jebusite heard thereof, they, that they gathered themselves together to fight with Joshua and with Israel with one accord. And when the inhabitants of Gibeon heard that Joshua had done unto Jericho and to Ai, they did work wilily and went and made as if they had been ambassadors and took old sacks upon their asses and wine bottles, old and rent and bound up. So if you recall this account, this is where they're pretending to be from some faraway land, but they're really close by. Okay? And the whole point of coming here is that the Hivites are mentioned by name along with the others. Uh, but here's an account that we might be familiar with that mentions the Hivites. Okay. Let's see. The last ones won't take very long. The Archite. They are said to be in Lebanon, just like the Hivite. They're mentioned in Joshua 16, also 2 Samuel 15. If you remember King David, one of his friends was Hushai the Archite. Okay, Hushai was the one that defeated the council of Ahitophel. Ahitophel, when, they, when he found out that they're not listening to him, went and hanged himself. Okay. When this was all during the Absalom saga, his, uh, whatever word you want to come up with there, drama, Probably would be a better term. Uh, so the archite is mentioned only those couple of times. The Sinite, 
the Arvadite, the Zemarite, Hamathite, like most of those are not really mentioned much. Uh, the Hamathite has the city of Hamath, so that one is mentioned at least once in Numbers 13, 21. Otherwise, these people groups, if I took the time, could point them out on the map. Otherwise, you can view them at your own leisure if you care. I know this isn't everyone's cup of tea, but um, I, I like some of the history and trying to figure out where everybody's coming from and the why for that. So before we begin talking about Nimrod, everybody's still awake. <laughs> <laughs> any thoughts or comments or anything on any of the ites or people we've looked at so far? All right. Now let's go back to Nimrod. Special case. Verse 8 says, Cush begat Nimrod, and he began to be a mighty one in the earth. He was a mighty hunter before the Lord, which might sound good up until that point, but it turns out he was not a good man. Wherefore it is said, even as Nimrod, the mighty hunter before the Lord. So this guy got so zealous about it that he became a proverb. I'm just going to point that out. Uh, but it says in verse 10, and the beginning of his kingdom was Babel and Iraq and or Iraq and Achad. <laughs> it's kind of fun to pronounce these. And Kelna in the land of Shinar. So there's a bunch that we're going to talk about here. I'm just going to give you the tip of the iceberg because we got five minutes left. But uh, the understanding of what's happening in history is up until this point, families were mostly in a patriarchal society, meaning the fathers or the eldest male was leading the local people. Okay? But Nimrod apparently united them okay, under his own kingdom. So that what was going on, and he was uniting them for a bad cause. Because it says very clearly, verse 10, the beginning of his kingdom was Babel. And we're going to find out in chapter 11 just what Babel was about. Right? It's against God. Let us make a name for ourselves. Let us go to heaven by ourselves and forget this God thing, right? So they had a very bad heart. So to be like Nimrod wasn't a good thing, spiritually speaking. Uh, but he did unite all of these under him. So the beginning of his kingdom was Babel, but he also had Erech e and all those other names that I don't want to pronounce, in the land of Shinar. Now, I want to talk about Shinar. <laughs> Yeah, some of these other things, I just that's just my own nerdiness. Let's just forget about that. Uh, so Nimrod was famous in his rebellion. So here's his kingdom. Okay, Shinar. Yes, okay, so we're on Shinar. Shinar is mentioned only eight times in Scripture. Okay, it's mentioned right here. If you look at chapter 11, hopefully it's on the same page for you, in verses 1 and 2, it says, The whole earth was of one language and of one speech, and it came to pass as they journeyed from the east that they found a plain in the land of Shinar, and dwelt there. Okay, so this is where in the land of Shinar is where all those places were that we just read in verse 10 of chapter 10, and Nimrod's kingdom began there. He began to be a mighty hunter, so it's just what he took upon himself to start doing. Genesis 14 is the next place where it's mentioned in verse 1. This is the famous, well, depending on, I guess, sort of famous fight where Lot is taken captive. But in Genesis 14, 1, it says it came to pass in the days of Amraphel, king of Shinar. So this is obviously after Nimrod. But uh, he was king of Shinar, Arioch, king of whatever, Elisar, Chetolayara, that guy, king of Elam, and title king of nations, that these made war against all those other guys. Okay. <laughs> it's fun to read sometimes, but... Here's the name of Shinar mentioned again. And so they're fighting, and he's going to eventually take Lot and his house captive. Verse 9 mentions Shinar again, same guy, Amraphel, king of Shinar. Then it's mentioned in Joshua 7. Joshua 7 and verse 21. It's a subtle mention of it. We'll see if you can pick it out. Joshua 7, verse 20, well, verse 20, so you get an idea of what's happening here. This is the account of Achan, Achan, however you really say it. 
uh, but Genesis, Joshua, Joshua 7, verse 20 says, And Achan answered Joshua and said, Indeed, I have sinned against the Lord God of Israel, and thus and thus have I done. When I saw among the spoils a goodly Babylonish garment and 200 shekels of silver and a wedge of gold of 50 shekels weight, then I coveted them, and I took them, and behold, they are hid in the earth in the midst of my tent and the silver under it. Did you see Shinar in there? It's Babylonish. It's translated Babylonish. In the Hebrew, it's Shinar. Okay, so this is from the land of Shinar, where Babylon is, and that's why they're calling it Babylonish. Okay, so it's a little subtle, but it's there. And uh, the, there's, th we got time? Yes. There's three more times where this is mentioned. If you turn to Isaiah 11:11. 11, 11. Isaiah 11:11. 11, 11. Giving a future prophecy. I could back up to 10, where it says, In that day there shall be the, a root of Jesse, which shall stand for an ensign of the people. To it shall the Gentiles seek, and his rest shall be glorious. So you know what that's talking about. And it shall come to pass in that day that the Lord shall set his hand again to the second time to recover the remnant of his people, which shall be left from Assyria and from Egypt and from Pathros and from Cush, Ethiopia, and from Elam and from Shinar. And from Hamath, again, that's the Hamathites, and from the islands of the sea, and so forth. So he's gathering Israel the second time. When is that? It's the time of the end, right before the millennial kingdom, right? Uh, during the tribulation period, he's going to gather all Israel into their place where they ought to go, right? He's going to send his four angels to the four corners of the earth, I think is what it calls it. You know, the four principal directions gather all of true Israel and bring them to their land, Okay. So there will be some true believer, believers in the land of Shinar at that time. Uh, what else we got? Daniel chapter 1, verse 2. Got just enough time for this in the next one. Daniel chapter 1, verse 2. Verse 1 <laughs> it says, In the third year of the reign, Jehoiakim, king of Judah, came Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, unto Jerusalem and besieged it. And the Lord gave Jehoiakim, king of Judah, into his hand with part of the vessels of the house of God, which he carried into the land of Shinar, to the house of his God, and he brought the vessels into the treasure house of his God. So Babylon is still going strong, right, at this point. This is still the kingdom of Babylon. And this is when God allows Babylon to take captive Israel into the land of Shinar. Okay? So Shinar's got quite the history. Shinar is still over there today. It's going to become more prominent after we're out of here. right? Uh, so we'll talk about that. Yeah, maybe I'll save the last verse till next week and give you a chance to say something if you like. Uh, the last time it's mentioned is in Zechariah 5 in case anyone wants to do their own homework. But uh, there's some more things to be said a little bit more about Shinar and Babylon, as well as the last or the next couple of verses in Genesis 10. So any closing thoughts? This is all riveting, right? <laughs> it is to me. <laughs> That's good. <laughs> I like to joke about it. I do enjoy this. I like seeing I history and where people are. It helps me realize that's the true meaning of the term but it helps me realize the words on the, in the bible right? these are real people real people groups uh you can imagine you know the the dugites you know that i'm starting you know or something like that and and how we are spreading out we're not spreading out anywhere yet uh but for me the the points have spread out quite a bit you know we're all over this country so like it's it's kind of fun to see well here there's cush and in, in Ashkenaz and all these guys, and there's where they spread out, and, and of these guys were all the earth, or the isles of the Gentiles overspread. So I, there's that. And I really enjoy, too, learning about Babylon, because it does have a prominent place in the Bible. So, all right.
that was fun. Let's close on a word of prayer. Uh, Father God, we do thank you for the history lesson. Thank you for the reality of these people uh, going through this life, meaning this side of heaven, awaiting uh, what we hope, the resurrection uh, unto everlasting life, though we understand with words that you share, like the iniquity is not yet full, that many of them uh, rejected you. So it's, it's sad when we think about that and understand that the mystery of iniquity is still already at work. But, Father, we pray that as we study your word and learn more about history and who we have come from or where we have come from to help us live as we ought to today as saints, that uh, we can make the most of every day to help others see the truth, the light of your glorious gospel through Christ, that they may be saved as well. It's in Christ's name I pray. Amen.